got a, uh, a great service this morning uh, that we're in the middle of, and it's going to be a good day. So I'm going to have you, if you have a Bible, I'm going to ask you, ask you to open it to Colossians chapter 1. Uh, I know if you're, if you're into the Bible at all and you know the Christmas story, you know that uh, the book of Colossians is not probably not high on the reading list at Christmas time, but uh, we're going to take a look at it today, and uh, I'm going to give you a little backstory to this, because I don't often do this. Um, I, had a, uh, I had an entirely different message prepared for this morning, and uh, last night I start looking over my notes. I do that on Saturdays, just kind of flip through my notes and make sure I feel good about the message going into the next day, and uh, last night I told my wife, I said, I, I think the message might be different tomorrow than what I have planned. And, uh, and she kind of looked at me funny. And there's a part of me as a pastor, as a preacher, I would tell you, uh, man, maybe the Holy Spirit's changing the sermon for Sunday. Um, but I think the really the better way to describe that whole process is uh, I think I was a little bit late to the party. I think I was not maybe paying attention quite like I should have all week long. I think the Holy Spirit always wanted me to talk about this. Uh, I don't think he saved that, <laughs> that instruction for last night. I think I just now caught up with him. And so uh, we're going to talk about something different than I had planned. And so it's going to come from the book of Colossians. And if you have a Bible, you can open it. And I have a little place you can take some notes on the back of your listening guide. I hope that you'll do that. And... Uh, and again, I told you this last week, when it comes to Christmas, we all have our defaults already set. And by the time, uh, you know, we get this close to Christmas Day, man, we are in the throes of Christmas. There's no stopping it. The snowball has effectively gone down the hill, right? We are not stopping Christmas. Some of you have uh, most of your shopping. How many of you got all of your sh Christmas shopping done? Every man, you guys are good. And uh, how many of you are like, I still got a couple days. How many of you are there? Okay, there's the real people. All right, so... Some of you are, like, that's all that our minds are consumed with. So I'm going to ask you permission to ask everybody to pause what you're thinking about when it comes to Christmas. Can we just take a little break from all of the hustle and the bustle? Can we just take a, a little break and focus our attention and ask this one question? God, what do you want to show me about yourself? God, what do you want to show me about yourself? That would be my request today is, is, is we enter in this time of of looking at God's word, that we would ask God to show us what he wants to show us about himself. And so uh, if you have a Bible, look at in Colossians chapter 1, and uh, I want to read this to you, and we're going to walk through this. Um, I'm going to walk through it a little bit of how I have my own priority time. Uh, earlier this year, I was in the book of Colossians, which is probably why it's fresh in my mind, and, and I feel really drawn to it. But in Colossians chapter 1, if you start in verse 15, um, this is what it says, talking about Jesus. This is Paul writing, making sure the people in this town called Coloss, the Colossian church, that they would be very aware of the Jesus they believe in, which is a really good place for us to be when it comes to Christmas. Because at Christmas time, we all know the story of Christmas, but are you sure about what you believe about Jesus? That's a vastly different thing. We all know the right answers, right? We know that Christmas is about Jesus, but are you sure in what you believe about Jesus? Not just that Christmas is about him. So it's, it's, a, it's a completely different approach. So if we understand clearly who Jesus was and what he's all about, then we can make a reasonable step of faith. We can place our faith and belief in him. And that's the goal. Jesus is not simply someone that we talk about and ha who has a historical track record. We just know he has a, a life and he lived and he died. We're not, we don't think of Jesus like all the other historical characters we might study. Jesus is an altogether different type of person. So we have to understand him in order to really understand what we believe. So in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, it says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. So he says, he's the image of the invisible God. Now this is interesting because if you, if you look back at how all of creation works, if you remember, go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1 when God is establishing the earth and, and creating all, of, uh, all the things that we know to be the creation, and he gets to the creation of human beings. And do you guys remember what God said to himself? What God said among himself, him, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, what they said to each other? They said, let's make man in our own image. So we're a little bit like this. We were made in the image of God. In many ways, we are like little images of the invisible God. 
But we are not the image of the, invis- of the invisible God. We are similar to God because he made us in his image, but we are not the image of the invisible God. So when it comes to Jesus, Paul is making it clear. He is the image of the invisible God. He, and this is interesting because if you go and you really study what he's meaning here, he is not just a replica or like a, uh, like a graven image, like a statue. He's not like that. He is a representative of and a manifestation of. Now, that's a big word, manifestation. A manifestation means he is here in person. So, like, uh, if if you come from maybe a a long history of being in the church, you may have heard this phrase, uh, the manifest presence of God. Has anybody ever heard that phrase before? The manifest presence of God. So it would be like um, if you come to a worship service and it just there's a sense that God's here with us. There's just a real, real, almost tangible, but not tangible, but almost tangible sense that God is with us. If you've ever been in a situation like that, you know what I mean. That's the manifest presence of God. It's as if God is letting us know in, in more than just an intellectual way, he's letting us know he's in the building. He's here. He's the manifest presence of God. Jesus is not only the image bearer of God like we are, He is the manifest presence of God. He is the presence of God. So when we see this, so we're thinking about Christmas, right? We're thinking about a baby in a manger. And Jesus comes to be the image of the invisible God. This answers the question. This is what all of history has been waiting for. We want a way to understand God. We want to understand who made us. All of history records that humanity is reaching up for, for God. Every, every people group, every civilization, all of history, there is something in man that reaches out for God and says, God, where are you? And did you guys know that Christianity is the only religion or faith where God reaches down to man? It's the only, only one of its kind. Where God says, I'm not only going to answer your question that, yes, I'm here, I'm going to come to you. I'm going to come down to you. And so Jesus, when he arrived as this little baby in a manger in Bethlehem, he was the image of the invisible God. And it says, the firstborn over all creation. Now, this is throwing a lot of people off. They're like, the firstborn over all, all creation. Is that when Jesus was created? Was Jesus created when he was born in Bethlehem? Was he created through his conception and delivery in Bethlehem? No. Jesus has always been here. Jesus is God. The the idea of him being called the firstborn brings into this idea the stature that God has given Jesus over all of creation. See, in ancient family life, the firstborn was the heir to all the power, all the throne, all the, all the influence. So a father would pass that on to his child, his firstborn son. And so here, when he's referred to as the firstborn, Paul is telling us that Jesus is the rightful leader in authority over our lives. He's the firstborn. He's the leader. He's the authority over all things. He's the firstborn over all creation. It doesn't mean he was the first one born in creation because we know that's not true, right? He wasn't the first one born. Lots of people were born before Jesus was born. Jesus existed long before all those people. He created all those people. But he gets the only status as the firstborn. He becomes the authority. This is critical for our understanding. Keep reading. He says, for by him... All things were created. Now that's interesting because that proves he wasn't just a regular old baby. Right? Because he was before all things. He created all things. All things were created by him. So here's the, here's the, the bottom line for today. Jesus represents these three components in our lives. He is God with us. He is God for us. And he is God through us. Paul is trying to help us hold on to this idea of who Jesus really is. And he is absolutely God. And he says he is God with us. And we all celebrate that at Christmas time, that God came to be with us. And that's entirely true. Jesus came as this little baby to prove that God is with us. 
He's the firstborn, it says, over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, the visible things and the invisible things, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things, listen to this, were created by him and for him. So when you get this picture in your mind of who created the universe, my guess is 99% of us have this mental picture of God, this, whatever that image is in your mind, God, God the Father sort of idea, created everything. Right? God created everything. Most of us don't think that Jesus created everything. It kind of throws our mental image off, doesn't it? That Jesus created everything. And this is the danger. This is what Paul is actually trying to address is this separation idea between God and Jesus. And we all do it. We do it passively. We don't do it on purpose. But we sort of say, okay, there's God. There's God the Father. And then second to God, kind of another rung down, is Jesus. And Paul's trying to illustrate this, that it's almost impossible to fathom intellectually that God, even though he is not Jesus, Jesus is God. Does that make any sense at all? It probably doesn't. This is the doctrine of the Trinity. It's really hard to get. There's nothing analogous to it. I have heard lots of people try to come up with ways to explain this idea of the Godhead, that there are three persons but one God. And I'll just tell you, any illustration you come up with comes short. I promise you. Somebody heard some preacher say one time that it was like the egg, right? An egg has three distinct parts. It's like the shell, the yolk, and the white. And it's all an egg. But here's the thing. It's not all the same. The yolk has no whiteness or shellness to it. Does that make any sense? Jesus has godness to him. The Holy Spirit has godness in him. The Father has godness in him. They all share a common quality of being God. Yet they are distinct in person. It's impossible to explain. You have to believe it by faith. So the temptation we have is to say, okay, God's up here. He's the creator and everything. And then there's Jesus. He kind of came second. He came later in the process. He did not. He was with God at the beginning, which means, this is why it's so important. This means that when we turn our attention to Jesus at Christmas time, we are turning our attention to God. We are looking at God. And everything that Jesus came to represent and everything that he came to manifest in front of us is important because it tells us about God. God did not leave us in the dark. He sent Jesus so that for every person who ever said, I would believe if I could see, now we can see. Now we can see. Some of you go, well, that was 2,000 years ago. How can we see? We see through the story. We, th- we see through the gospel story of Jesus. That's how we have sight. Because to this day, historically, nobody on earth denies that Jesus came to earth. You might not like that Jesus came to earth. You may not believe in him as the Savior. But nobody denies whether Jesus actually came or not. It's historically documented. Jesus came to earth. So we see through the story of the gospel. So this is the good news of Christmas. God did not leave us in the dark. He sent Jesus to be the image of the invisible God so that we would know him. And I think it's interesting that Jesus comes as this vulnerable little baby. Right? He comes as this vulnerable vulnerable little baby. Why Why didn't he break into history like this mighty warrior? I think because... He wanted us to all know he could sympathize with our vulnerability and our weakness and our struggles. Jesus submitted himself to becoming a little baby. He entrusted himself into the hands of flawed people, just like we do. He understands our struggles. He understands our vulnerabilities so that when we understand that We come to faith in Christ and we want to give our lives to Christ. We understand that we don't have a Savior who can't sympathize with us. He has lived life on this earth. He has run across people who have done him wrong. He has been wounded and hurt and mistreated far more than any of us have ever been mistreated. 
And that's why it's so critical that we understand this concept that Jesus is God with us. And then it says that all things were created by him, in verse 16, by him and for him. All things were created by Jesus. In other words, there's no rogue creator out there. All, even all the bad stuff we see in the world, somehow that's all under God's authority and under God's care. God created everything. And the question always is, how can a good God allow all this bad stuff? Let me explain that. Let me clear this up. Everybody's got these questions about God. How can God allow bad things? God doesn't just allow bad things like it's fun for him. God has a purpose in everything he created. What does the scripture say? Scripture says, all things were created by him and what? And for him. If there is anything happening in this world that is not happening for him, for his good purpose, it is a, it is a sinful expression. It is a broken and flawed expression of God's creation that is in desperate need of God to heal it and redeem it. It's out of line from God's original intent. So when we look at our own lives, you know that part of us that doesn't line up with God? where we've missed the mark of God's best, God would say to you, I made you, personally I made you, I'm, you, you were made by me and you were made for me. The message of the gospel is that if you are breathing air today in this world, God made you for him. He made you to find your life in him. He made you to be one of his children. And he wants you, he wants you to live for him. And that's the, that's the beauty of the gospel story, is that Jesus came to prove that God is real and that you can now see him and you're not in the dark anymore and that you were made with a purpose to fulfill. And that purpose can only be found in him. For everyone in here who feels like they've been abandoned by God or they've been forgotten in this world and they just don't have a purpose in life, God has made you with a purpose. He made you for him. He made you for him. I feel like the Lord gave me this little sentence I want to just share with you. Your life has a Christ-centered best. Your life has a Christ-centered best. Whatever other things you think you're doing to make your life better than it is, the only best you can really find is your Christ-centered best. And that's what Christmas is all about, that we would surrender every other dream and every other pursuit, and we would come to Christ and say, our best is found in you, not in all these other things. I think it's funny how that works when we look at Christmas, because I will tell you, I am guilty of this probably as much or more than anybody else in here. There's a part of me, like a lot of you, that thinks, man, if I only had this, this, and this, or maybe if my kids only had this, this, and this, that's going to really make their lives better. Don't we all do that? That's what Christmas is all about, right? We want to buy our kids stuff. We want to buy family member stuff. We want to get stuff because that's going to make our lives better. And, and we do that in the middle of a season that is all about God giving us the only real thing we needed and really the last thing we'll ever need. It's almost funny how, it how, how we push those things that close together that we would have all these wants and desires and needs. And meanwhile, God has given us everything we need in Christ. It's interesting. So verse 17, we keep reading. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So Jesus is before all things. So before you were ever around, before you ever faced a problem, before you ever had a, a bad day, God is before all of that. Jesus is before all of that. And it says, in him, in Jesus, all things hold together. Jesus is literally the glue that holds all of life together. If, there's a, if there is a sense of togetherness or peace or wholeness about life, it's coming from Jesus. Not, by the way, from you. Amen. There you go. Randall's here. Good to have Randall in the house. <laughs> Randall always says this to me in the lobby today. He said, he said, uh, give it to us today, Pastor. I said, I'll give you whatever I got. He says, and I'll give it back. And uh, <laughs> there's Randall. There we go. 
And so here's, it's amazing. Jesus is both the source of life and the secret to life. Because we're all after the secret, right? What's it going to really make, what's it going to take to make life work? How is it all going to come together? How do we make relationships work? How do we make career work? How do we make life work? Jesus is both the source of life and the secret to life. So if you want to make your life work, you don't try to manipulate everything around you. You first go to Jesus. Now, you guys know how much I am passionate about, and I can hardly not talk about marriage when I get up and talk about anything, right? I kind of go there. It's just kind of a default in me. Just talk about marriage and family and that kind of stuff. That's part of who God has just made me to be. That's one of the things he does in and through me. I was thinking about this point. It says, before him are all things, and in him all things hold together. And I started thinking about marriage. And I want to first talk to all of the single people in the house, okay? If you're a teenager, I'm not really talking to you because you're not really in a zone where you could get married yet, but I'm really talking about the singles, okay? All the people who are not married that could be married. Um, Let me just speak to you for a minute. Um, Because I do talk, just admittedly, I talk about marriage a lot, and I don't always remember to loop you guys in. And so I wanna wanna start with all the single people today. Um, This is the time of year where, as a single person, you probably feel more aware of your singleness than you do any other time of the year. You just feel very aware of your singleness. And oftentimes, that could put you in a category of feeling very alone. And then that makes you have to think about, if I'm alone, well, then maybe I'm not worthy of somebody. And I want to just caution that thinking. Because what ends up happening with a lot of singles this time of year is this becomes the time of year where you compromise in your life. You compromise socially, you compromise sexually, you compromise morally in some way because you feel maybe more desperate than normal. You feel alone and you don't like feeling alone. And let me just say, the fact that God sent himself as Jesus, the image of the invisible God, you are not alone. Now, I know it's hard to cuddle up on a couch with Jesus. I got you. Okay, I get it. And you have those desires and you want to do all that stuff and it's Christmas time and baby, it's cold outside. I got you. Maybe all this warm weather, God's doing you a favor. I don't know. Um, But I want to just encourage you, do not compromise your integrity this time of year. Don't do it. Remember that in him, All things are held together. Your sense of wholeness as an individual person is held together by him, not somebody else. It's held together by him, not that lowercase him or that lowercase her, that capital him. And so I want to just encourage all the singles to be more committed than ever. As of today, you be committed to Christ. Don't give up on that. Don't compromise. Don't start lagging. You stay focused on what Christ has for your life today. You will never regret giving your best to Jesus today. Now for the married people, what this time of year can do in your life is it can suddenly resurface all these ways your marriage isn't doing so well. Because there's stress, there's a lot of stuff going on, and when stressful people live together, They explode all over each other. They yell at each other. They scream. They fight. They cuss. They throw things. Bad things happen, right, when when we're stressed. And it suddenly reminds you that things aren't as happy and, and great as you want them to be in your marriage. And so what do we do? We start trying to fix things. And we dodge issues and we confront too much or whatever we do. But I also want to encourage you, in the same way, we are to remember that it's in Christ that all things are held together. Your marriage will only be held together if you go to Christ. If you remember that Jesus is what holds you together. Your commitment to Christ, listen closely so I don't, you don't misquote me here. Your commitment to Christ has to outrank your commitment to your marriage. Amen. Don't misquote me now. I didn't say you should be uncommitted to your marriage. But your commitment to Christ should be so great that it pulls up your commitment to your marriage. 
it raises your commitment to your marriage. You being more committed to your marriage will not necessarily make you committed to Christ. So you can be diehard committed to your marriage and lose it completely because you're not committed to Christ. We are committed to Christ first, and in him all things are held together. And somehow, because of Jesus living in us, the Holy Spirit in us, we are given a whole new insight on how to love that person we call husband or wife. That's the plan of God for you, because in him all things are held together. You've heard us talk a little bit about re-engage here at High Point. I got an incredible text message from um, Ryan Mullins, uh, who directs our Reengage program. Reengage is a ministry for people whose marriages are boring, bruised, or broken. And if you fall in any of those categories, I'm going to suggest you jump into our spring semester of reengage. Here's the text message I get yesterday. It's probably why it's on my mind. He says, You won't believe this. He says, and he sent me the picture. I can't, I'm not going to name the couple. I'm not sure if I have permission or not. But the couple's picture. Um, it's like a Christmas picture of them being together and they're talking about uh, their relationship and their love. They showed up to re-engage like 16 plus weeks ago with divorce papers in their hands. The husband had to borrow five grand from his dad to, to purchase the divorce, uh, to pay the lawyers for the divorce that they had. They had papers in their hands. The only reason they weren't signed is because they were waiting on getting in front of a notary. Or maybe God was at work. And they show up to re-engage. They go through the process. They tore up those divorce papers. And do you know what that father said? He said, if my $5,000 was an investment for you to go to this program and get help and save your marriage, it was a worthy investment. Isn't that incredible? And I'm telling you, all these couples who think, Man, I just don't think our, my mar- our marriage has it. I just don't think we have hope. I'm just telling you, you do. Because y- your hope, if you're looking at yourself or you're looking across the table at your spouse, you don't have hope. I'll give you that one. But in Christ, all things are held together. And you need to put yourself in a place where you can reconnect with Christ. And because of that, he will hold all things together. He will bring it back together. And you can save what God intended to be for a lifetime. I have to move on. Okay. Oh, for those who need it, there's information about re-engage at our Next Steps booth. I don't want to forget that because some of the people are going, where do I go? Go out there to Next Steps, please, and get help. And we also uh, printed up these business cards. I want, I want all of you to go there so no one feels embarrassed to go in there. Uh, everybody go to just flood, flood Next Steps after the service and ask for the cards because some of you need to take some of those re-engaged business cards to your next family gathering. <laughs> and slot them over to that family member and say, show up here. Say, we'll take it with you. We'll come with you. Because our, our marriage, every marriage needs a little work. We'll go through it too. So come on, let's all go together and, and invite them to come. Okay, all right, this is, we're, 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 st- we're getting better. Keep following. Verse 18. And Jesus, he is the head of the body, which is the church. And he is the beginning and the firstborn. There it is again. And the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. So Paul's making this case. Jesus is above everybody. Now we all get it. Jesus is the head of his church. We get that, even though we don't always treat him that way. He has that role. It's kind of obvious. He's the head of his church. But this other group, the people who are not in Christ, the people who are not, who don't find their life in Christ, they're considered the people who are dead. They're dead in their trespasses and sins. He is the firstborn of the dead. He is like the firstborn son. He's the authority over even the dead. Now, here, why is that important? If you, if you want to flip there, you can. It'll be on the screen. Philippians chapter 2 says that Christ Jesus, verse 5, you know, going into verse 6, Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, remember, he's God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or held on to, but he made himself nothing, taking on The very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, because he humbled himself, God exalted him to the highest place. Not not a high place, the highest place. He exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. 
Now, this is the whole firstborn thing. He gave him the name above all names. For what reason? Look at verse 10. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is what God was doing at Christmas. God sent Jesus, his only son, to be the firstborn of creation. In other words, he's over all things. He is the authority over all things. He is Lord over creation. And then, in that practical sense, that when Jesus rose from the dead after his crucifixion, he became Lord of the church, everyone who believes in him, and he became Lord of the dead, Lord of all those who don't believe in him. Jesus is the undisputed Lord of all people. And there will come a day that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. It may not be today. Whether If you don't confess Jesus as Lord at some point on this earth, you will one day whether you want to or not. Because God has made him the Lord over all things. Verse 19 says, For God was pleased to have his fullness dwell in him. So in other words, Jesus is not a secondary version of God. He's not a rung down. You don't get a second best God when you believe in Jesus. All the fullness of God lives in him. So if you believe in Jesus, you get every bit of God when you believe in Jesus. The fullness of God dwells in him. In verse 20, and through him to reconcile himself to all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross, Jesus was God's reconciliation plan. He reconciled people back to him. Verse 21, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. What Jesus did for you because of his death, his physical death on the cross, it required him to be born a man so that he could live a blameless life, so that he would qualify to be the spotless lamb to give his life as a sacrifice for you so that you could be reconciled to God so that you would get this. Now, this will blow your mind so that no matter what you've done in your past, you receive the title holy. Josh actually said it when he was in his worship facilitation. He says, God took a bunch of sinners and made them saints. And that is is absolutely true. Sinful people like you and me are given a status of holiness, not because of what we've done, but because of what he's done. It was given to us so that we would be blameless before God. I have to think that there are people in this room who have never unwrapped that gift. There are people in this room who have never recognized that Jesus, who was born in a manger, is the Savior of the world and the person who gave his life for you so that you could find forgiveness of your sins, so that you could be called holy and blameless. And this morning, before we take communion and celebrate what Christ has done, I want to give you an opportunity to place your faith in Christ. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And as I do that, remember... Jesus is God with us, Jesus is God for us, and then Jesus is God through us. So today is a moment where as a church family, we recognize we have just heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus, in every way, is right here with us. He is in this room, and he is inviting you to place your faith in him. If you have never done that, if you would say, Andy, I can't think of a time where spiritually speaking, I have, I have bowed on my knees and proclaimed him the Lord of my life. And if you have not done that, right where you're seated, every head bowed, every eye closed, say this prayer in your heart right where you're seated. Say, dear Jesus, today I confess I'm a sinner. Say, Jesus, today I confess I am a sinner. 
and say, Jesus, I believe that you came to live a perfect life, die on the cross for my sins, be raised from the dead, and live eternally with God so that I could be reconciled to God. Just tell him that. Say, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe in all you've done so that I could be made right with God. Say, Jesus, today, I believe in you.